I don't have much time. I've got to make a decision. I have to I have to look through the fog of this complexity and try to try to figure out what to do next. Maybe yes, I just need to think logically. So there are three risks. The first risk is, well, of course, it's to the patient. This guy's 57 years old. He's dying. He doesn't really have any options. The only, the biggest risk maybe for him is if we do nothing. Well, the second risk is clear. It's to the company. We've worked on this for years now, and if this case doesn't go well, you know, we could, we could be done. The company could be over, all the families of my employees would suffer, and all the shareholders would suffer. Of course, the third risk is to this very promising technology. If this case goes badly, who's going to do the next one? Well, Dr. Cribier, you know, he's just trying to save this guy's life. This, this whole technology was his idea. Well, this guy comes in, 57, in cardiogenic shock. He's almost dead. Bad lungs, bad legs, terrible heart. I know, he's just trying to save his patient's life. Dr. Leon, I've talked with him. We've worked together for years. He's been a part of all of this, and he thinks we ought to do this case. I trust him. So, how do we make a decision about placing a revolutionary technology for the very first time in the very first patient? It was April 2002. It was a matter of life and death. Well, it started with this really wonderful idea. After years of work, Dr. Cribier, based upon some of the work from Henning Anderson, had this idea that we could expand a heart valve in a patient's heart without opening up their chest. An amazing, revolutionary idea. Imagine replacing a heart valve without looking at it, only through x-rays, sparing these old patients open heart surgery, cardiac arrest. And several of us were committed to it. There's Dr. Leon. He's an old trusted friend. We worked together for years. Brilliant, energetic man. One of the smartest people I've ever met. Dr. Cribier, incredibly inventive, incredibly talented, a wonderful human being. And Stan Rabinovich, my, my very dear friend. So, with his organizational skills and the talents we've developed for years as working in biomedical engineering, here we are teaming up two biomedical engineers and two cardiologists. And this is the best of early stage radical development because the doctors don't know actually how to build these products, and the engineers can't ever really look into the minds and the hands of the doctors. It's the perfect team. All of us were committed in 1999 to bring this technology to patients. So here we are, a piece of paper. There it is. Go make a device. How do you do that? Well, we need resources first, right? So, we go to venture capital, some of the top venture capital companies in the world, and we told them our story. Hey, guys, we got a great idea. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to develop a heart valve you can implant in a patient without open heart surgery. Yeah, you just run it up through the leg, you have it collapse down on this catheter, and you can open it up and replace their heart valve. And they said, wow. I never heard of that one before. That's pretty interesting. We'll look into it. And we would leave, and they would pick up the phone, and they would call the experts. And the experts were 
the cardiothoracic surgeons. And what did they say about it? Are you kidding me? What do you mean? We treat all these patients. They're, you know, we have incredible outcomes, and they do. They're amazing, amazing clinicians. They can open up your chest, stop your heart, and do amazing surgery. They did not like this technology. They didn't think it would work. They didn't think it would be durable. They thought it would be terribly inferior. It was hard. It was hard to get funding. But we finally found it, thanks to Jeff and Yuval. They came in, and they helped us. And we did what any, any company does, right? We moved from our spare bedroom in our house to a sparse office. And we decorated it. You see, it was the second time I'd ever heard about aortic stenosis, this disease we were treating. The first time was Tony. Tony's mom had aortic stenosis. Tony was a brilliant scientist that worked with me. We were good friends. And he searched long and hard for some alternative for her to have open heart surgery because she was not eligible. Like most of these patients, they're 80, in, uh, they're 80 years old, 90 years old. They have a lot of frailty and other comorbid conditions and they could not have open heart surgery. So Tony looked far and wide, and what did he find? Well, he found Dr. Cribier. Dr. Cribier at the time didn't have this technology. He could put a balloon in her and maybe save her life for months. But she would not travel from Yorkshire to, to Rouen, France for treatment. So she died of her disease. We also hung on our wall Dr. Cribier's mother. She also had aortic stenosis. And, well, she wasn't sick enough to have surgery. She didn't need it badly enough, but she was on her way, as many of these patients are. So she was a reminder that we needed to do this fast. We needed to make this available as soon as we could to these patients, your grandmothers. I'm reminded of this great generation. I've had the privilege of meeting some of them. They survived the Great Depression. They survived World War II. And so many of them needed desperately some alternative to this open heart surgery. Because without it, about half, them will, half of them will die in six months with severe aortic stenosis. It is more deadly than most aggressive cancers. Well, we took this money and we started engineering a product. And I wish I could tell you we were brilliant at it. We weren't. This was real innovation. There was no predicate. We made, frankly, embarrassing things like this. <laughs> they would last minutes, uh, maybe hours. Uh, how long do you want your heart valve to last? Yeah. Uh, but I can tell you, um, I think like most real innovation, it takes iteration. And we struggled and we learned and we failed and we struggled and we learned and we had these brilliant engineers in Israel, Itai and Asaf and Netanel and Abby and Benjamin and they poured their hearts and souls into making this work. And we got better. We got better and better and they started working. And, I can tell you it takes a lot of testing to bring one of these and put it in a patient. And it should. I mean, you need to do testing. And there's some great testing you can do. And we got better and better to the point where we could do kind of the ultimate test before going into man, and that is you do long-term implantations in sheep. Now, I wish we didn't have to use animals for testing. But before we put this in your grandmother, we really want to know that it works for some period of time in these animals and then study it very carefully. And we did that. We finally got to the point where we were doing these safety studies, but we weren't quite ready for our first inman. You know, part of the challenge in these animal studies too is that you're having to look through this information and understand that it's very imperfect. I'm treating a young, healthy sheep. It's not the same as treating an 80 or 90-year-old patient. 
the tissues are different, the heart's different, the legs are different. So many of, of the stuff that we learn is difficult to interpret and know whether it's going to work. You do the best you can, but you really don't know. Well, I, I think I've waited long enough. I'm going to have to call these guys and let them know what I'm going to do. Asaf, Stan, yeah, I've thought about it. Listen, guys, we're going to do this case. Yeah, I know, I know. This is not the case we wanted to do. This is a, a very frail patient. He's dying, and you know the technology could work, and the patient could still die. And if that happens, you know what's going to happen? The, the French FDA is going to say, we experimented on this patient, we killed him. I don't know. It's tough, but we, we need to do this. Here's the reason why we need to do it, because we get the privilege of saving one patient's life. And you know what? If we do that, maybe we have the opportunity to save another and another. So, Asaf, I want you to take the team, uh, the device, head up to, uh, to uh, Rouen and uh, support Dr. Cribier's case. Listen, safe travels, my friend. Bye. I didn't really sleep that night. I sat by the phone. I waited. Dr. Cribier finally called. He said, it was a really tough case. The patient died. But they did not give up. While they pounded on this patient's chest, Dr. Grivier put that device up into this patient's heart. And it worked. It was the first time anybody had ever done an aortic valve replacement without open heart surgery. It was a miracle. This patient who was dying, ashen, almost dead, sat up and had a glass of champagne with Dr. Cribier and talked with him that night. He held a press conference the next day. It was everything we'd hoped for. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we've studied this device now. And in randomized controlled trials, it reduces mortality by 50% in these old sick patients who can't have surgery. And we continue to study it. 500 centers have now been trained and are using this device, and 50,000 patients have now been implanted. We were unfortunately the 43rd country in the world to get this technology. We've got to do better than that. Many clinical studies have been done, and I'm really pleased to tell you that not only does this save lives, but it improves the quality of life. And this is what these patients really want. They're, they will say, I'm willing to risk my life for this procedure, but I just want to feel better. And they do. They feel much better. And what's happened to Masaf and Stan and Dr. Cribier and Dr. Leon 10 years after we started this venture? We're all still working on this technology, trying to make it better for these patients. You know, I'm reminded about Mrs. Sonigo. I was visiting Rouen, France, and um, Dr. Cribier was taking me around from center to center. I was looking at cases and meeting some of the staff there and talking with them about what they were going to do next and some of their training activities and all this. And Madame Sonigo just happened to be in the hospital that day getting a checkup. She was out like two years. 
and she was doing great. I had already heard she was doing well. But like many of these patients, again, she was very sick before she came in for therapy. Well, she heard I was in the hospital and she tracked me down. And she came up to me and she said, thank you for saving my life. I didn't know what to say. So, I held her hand and I kissed her and I talked with her and I said, how are you doing? She said, well, I've been vacationing in the south of France with her grandchildren and her two wonderful daughters. You know, I drove away from Rouen that day and I felt, I felt inadequate. I felt inadequate because I could not explain to her. I couldn't tell her the relevance she brought to my life. Thank you.